Good morning, everyone. I want to start this morning by telling you about my late Uncle Jimmy. I adored my Uncle Jimmy. He was a very funny man who used to make me laugh a lot. In fact, funny is probably not the right term. He was actually quite cheeky and quite mischievous. And he would often tell me stories about his exploits as a truck driver. And one of the things that really stood out to me as he would tell these stories was that Uncle Jimmy was a man who really sought to minimise his compliance to the law of the roads. Uh, being a truck driver, he wanted to get uh, deliveries of uh, stock done very, very quickly, and so he would try and speed quite a bit. And he would tell me that the way in which he would try and get around being caught was by spraying hairspray on his number plates, uh, because according to him, uh, speed cameras weren't able to take photos very effectively where cars or trucks had number plates sprayed with hairspray. Uh, when he did get caught, and it seems that he often did, uh, he had a way of being able to escape losing points, he told me, and uh, that way was by paying the fine but paying $5 too much. And he said what would happen was that uh, the RTA would send him a cheque for $5, he would never bank it. And because of that, the RTA was unable to clear uh, this fine and this loss of points from its system. So in effect, he kept his points and he wouldn't lose his license. Now, I'm not mentioning any of those things so that you might uh, go and do them yourself, but again, just to really stress that Uncle Jimmy was a man who sought to minimise his compliance with the law as he drove his truck. Now, I mention all of that because uh, today we're continuing to look at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Our focus today is on chapter 5, verses 27 to 37. And one thing that really comes out clearly as we look at the Sermon on the Mount is that Jesus does not want us to minimise our obedience of God's law. Uh, Jesus does not want us to be minimising our commitment to live a righteous life in response to being forgiven of our sins and made one of God's people. Now, what Jesus wants us to do, and this is really what he's urging us to do in the Sermon on the Mount, is to maximise our obedience to God, to maximise our commitment to being righteous. And indeed, that's what Jesus is talking about when he says that our righteousness must surpass that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Now, this morning, as we look at verses 27 to 37, we are going to focus on the issues of adultery, on divorce, and the taking of oaths or the making of promises. And one, one thing that we see, or one theme that uh, binds these three issues together is the theme of faithfulness. And so what we're going to see this morning as we look at these issues is that as followers of Jesus, as those who have been forgiven, we are to maximise our obedience to God, we are to maximise our commitment to righteousness, and one of the ways in which we do so is by maximising faithfulness. We seek to be faithful in our marriages and faithful in the things that we promise. Now, with all that in mind, let's uh, dive into these uh, three issues of adultery, divorce, and the taking of oaths or making of promises by looking, first of all, at the issue of adultery. And what we see is that adultery is not limited to sexual activity. Adultery is not limited to sexual activity. Now, what I want to do to start with is just to provide a bit of context and to describe the kind of scenario that Jesus is probably attacking uh, in these verses. So let's imagine this. I'm married. Uh, I have a wife and I'm not really happy with my wife at the moment. Uh, of course, that's not true. I love Alison and all that. But just for the sake of the example, I'm not happy, you know, in my marriage. Things aren't going well. But then I meet a new woman and I'm very attracted to her. And I actually want to pursue things further with her. And I kind of give her a bit of a look and, and she sort of recognises that I'm into her and, and uh, as a result of that, she starts to get into me and, and we're developing quite the bond. 
and we would like to take it further. However, we know that if we engage in sexual activity while I'm married to my wife, well, that makes me an adulterer. And so how do we make this relationship happen and avoid being an adulterer? Well, it seems that uh, people in Jesus' day thought that uh, the laws around divorce in Deuteronomy 24 provided a loophole for such a situation. Uh, the, the idea went like this, okay, well, I can say I've found something indecent about my wife, that's what Deuteronomy 24 says, I can write her a certificate of divorce and send her away, and then I can marry the person I'm now into and we can have sex and I'm not an adulterer. So it seems that people in Jesus' day were using the divorce law of Deuteronomy 24 as a loophole to really sort of get around being an adulterer. Well, Jesus will have none of that. And he makes the point that adultery is actually much more than just the sexual act of having sex with someone that you're not married to. Indeed, look at what he says about this in verses 27 to 28. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus says adultery is much more than just the sex act. It also includes a look. But what is the look that Jesus is speaking about here? Uh, there are many people who think that uh, Jesus is talking about the idea of looking at someone that you're not married to, uh, fantasizing about them, fantasizing that you're having sex with them. It's an adulterous fantasy. The worst sort of form of that is pornography. Now, it could be that Jesus is talking about that, but if he was, then what verse 28 says could change. Uh, so if that's what Jesus is referring to, then I would want to suggest that verse 28 would say this, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in his heart. Did you notice the two words I left out there? The words, with her. With her. Uh, there is a school of thought, friends, uh, around these verses, which suggests that what's being described here with these words, with her, is not me looking at someone and them having no idea about it, but the idea is that I look at someone in a flirtatious way in the hope that they will understand what I'm sort of uh, indicating and that they will respond with lust back. It's an act that actually involves someone else, I believe. Now, I want to assure you that fantasizing over uh, people you're not married to and watching porn are, are evils that need to be repented of. And if you are committed to living a life of righteousness that surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will strive to flee away from those sorts of things. But I think what Jesus is speaking about here is this idea of flirting with someone giving them a sense of your intentions so that they might respond back. You see, friends, the, the act of uh, adultery that we think of, the sexual act, well, you've got to start somewhere to get to that point. And I think that's what Jesus is speaking about here. He's saying, if you engage with someone in a flirtatious way with the aim of trying to spark something, well, you are acting with adulterous intent. That is adultery. So last week we heard that if you say the words raka in anger or you fool, that you're acting with murderous intent. Well, so if you are looking flirtatiously at someone with the aim of sparking something off, with the aim of getting a response, so you are acting in an adulterous way. Now, friends, Jesus is very clear that we need to flee from such behaviour even at that point. Have a look at verses 29 to 30. He says, If your right eye causes you to sin, 
gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Now, friends, uh, Jesus is not speaking literally in these verses at this point. Uh, He is using hyperbole, exaggerated language to make a very strong point. And the point is this, that if you find yourself acting with adulterous intent, even just with a flirtatious look, you've got to do all that you can to escape that situation. You've got to do all that you can to avoid being involved in such things. For God hates adultery. And adultery, friends, does not lead to a flourishing life at all. It causes great, great damage. And so we are to flee from it at all costs. I remember once at a former church that I worked at that uh, a person confided in me, uh, they were a married person, that they had fallen in love with their boss. Their marriage was unhappy. Uh, They had fallen in love with their boss and they asked me, what do I do? And as I looked at Jesus' words here, I said, you've got to quit your job. And God bless them, that's exactly what they did. It's exactly what they did. Friends, please don't think that you can somehow entertain such things. Just, again, the look is adulterous as far as God is concerned. The flirtatious look is adulterous. And there have been many people who have thought that they can maintain such sort of, you know, very strong emotional relationships and escape the sexual. But it just doesn't work that way. Indeed, uh, our church back in the 90s uh, experienced such a tragedy uh, when the youth worker of the time acted in an adulterous way. And speaking with those who were around back then, uh, the warning signs were clear, but they weren't heeded. If you find that you are being tempted to act in an adulterous way, whether it's just with a flirtatious look or beyond that, you've got to flee from that behaviour at all costs. You've got to take drastic action to get out of it, to avoid it. Now, again, coming back to the context and the kind of scenario that Jesus is attacking, uh, at this point, you know, the person sort of says, okay, I'm really uh, dig this person. I want to have sex with them, but I don't want to be an adulterer. So what do I do? Well, I divorce my wife so I can then marry that person and not be classed as an adulterer. Well, at this point, uh, Jesus has already said, you are an adulterer because you've been flirtatious. But he also talks about the fact that divorce is not a way to avoid adultery. Divorce is not a way to avoid adultery. Indeed, what Jesus tells us in verses 31 to 32 is that it actually generates adultery. Let's have a look at these verses. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, causes her to become an adulteress. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Here's one of the great tragedies of this idea of uh, divorcing someone so you can fulfill your adulterous desires. You actually cause the person that you have divorced to become an adulterer when they remarry. The exception to that, of course, says Jesus here, is if the person you have divorced was already an adulterer, was already acting in ways that were uh, sexually unfaithful. Uh, This is not a a get-out clause for a valid divorce here. No, Jesus is saying that adultery and divorce with remarriage, it generates adultery, except where adultery has already occurred. If you divorce someone, and back in those days, that would automatically lead to remarriage, you would cause the person you divorced to become an adulterer, and the one who married them would be committing adultery as well except if the one you divorced had already committed adultery. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, that's just unfair. 
That's just unfair that the person who really is the victim of divorce and who needs to remarry at this point is an adulterer. Well, friends, that's Jesus' point. That's exactly Jesus' point. If you divorce someone, you put them in a really bad situation, says Jesus. And that is profoundly unloving. And that's why you should not be engaged in such behaviour. Indeed, remember last week as we looked at murder and anger, uh, we, 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 we looked at the idea we've got to deal with our own anger, but what do we also need to do? We need to patch things up with those that we have wronged and made angry. Why? Well, because their anger can lead them to falling under the judgment of God and being punished. You know, that will happen to them because of our actions. And so we've got to sort things out so they don't have that happen to them. And it's the same here with divorce. We're not to go divorcing others because of our adulterous desires, because we actually put these people in a bad situation. Brothers and sisters, we must be faithful in our marriages. Because if we divorce people and they remarry, Jesus says they end up committing adultery unless they're already adulterers. And it's profoundly unloving for us to allow people to be put in such a situation. Now, friends, I, I think that uh, there's a couple of things that that tells us. One is just how highly God values marriage. Uh, Matthew 19 tells us, you know, what God has put together, let not man separate. God's intention for marriage is that it's for keeps. And when the marriage covenant is violated, well, God considers the results of all of that to be adulterous. What I think this also tells us is that if we are divorced and we're contemplating remarriage, then at the very least, we must be very, very cautious about the possibility of doing so. Uh, you see, if you know, remarriage leads to adultery somehow, which is what Jesus is, seems to be suggesting here, then we need to actually seriously ask the question, should I actually get remarried? Now, please be assured, friends, that uh, adultery, uh, in, in both the forms that Jesus is speaking about here, is not an unforgivable sin. And we shouldn't stigmatise those who have uh, had these things happen to them, uh, especially when they're repentant. There is no such thing as an unforgivable sin apart from not believing in Christ. And so if you've been caught up in that situation in either way, whether you have, in effect, brought about the adultery and caused others, or you've been one who's, you know, been the victim in that sense, the blood of Christ cleanses all things, friends, past, present and future. Be assured of that. But some of you at this point might be saying, why does God actually allow divorce and subsequently remarriage if it leads to adultery? Well, friends, God definitely allows for divorce in Deuteronomy 24. In Matthew 19, Jesus gives the reason for why God permitted that. And it was because of the hardness of men's hearts. That is, friends, there are times in marriages where uh, one of the partners, particularly, is acting in such sinful ways and unrepentant ways that it causes great harm to the one that they're married to. And I think that the divorce law, in a sense, was meant to deal with such situations. Indeed, there have been times in pastoral ministry where I have counselled people who are victims of unrepentant sin to actually seek the path of divorce. Friends, divorce is a tragedy. God's intention is for marriage to be preserved. There are some cases where, because of the harm within the marriage, that it needs to come to an end. But it's always a tragedy, friends. It's always a tragedy. And so what does Jesus want from us? 
He wants us to flee from adultery at all costs. He wants us to seek to be faithful to our marriages as best as we can. But again, if you are a victim of great harm, of unrepentant sin, divorce becomes an option. And so don't feel that you've got to endure harm in order to be faithful to what Jesus is saying here. But Jesus' big point is, maximise your faithfulness. Maximise your faithfulness in your marriage by not pursuing adulterous desires. And if you do feel those, you run away from them at all costs. And please don't see divorce as this loophole somehow to escape adultery. No, it actually generates adultery. Not just for you with your adulterous desires, but for the one that you divorce. And for one that they... who gets remarried to the person you've divorced. Maximise your faithfulness in the context of marriage. But that's not the only context where Jesus says we need to maximise our faithfulness. And this brings us to our third point. We must not make promises and oaths that contain escape clauses. Have a look at what Jesus says in verses 35 to 36. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Now, Friends, let me again give you context. There is a, a particular situation that Jesus is addressing in these verses. And it is one where the Jews had come up with this elaborate system of uh, the way in which you make oaths, which determine whether they are really binding or not so binding. And it seems that uh, what made something really binding was if you swore upon an object that was really close to God in heaven, that was really, really binding. But if you swore by an object that was on earth that is far away from God in heaven, it was not so binding. Indeed, uh, as I think about this system, uh, I think about uh, a couple of politicians of past times. I think of John Howard, who very much in the same spirit talked about core and non-core promises. You know, core promises you don't break, non-core promises, well, you can break those. Tony Abbott famously in an interview on uh, the 7.30 report on the ABC, talked about how you could trust in the promises that he had put in writing, but not so much in the ones that he had spoken verbally, especially in the heat of moment in an interview. Exactly the same spirit that's being talked about here. Well, Jesus points out the stupidity of all of this by talking about the transcendence of God. You know, the idea that uh, you can swear by something on earth because it's far away from God is ridiculous because God is everywhere. The earth is his footstool. The temple of Jerusalem is his temple. No, says Jesus in verse 37. Simply let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Make a vow and be determined to keep it or don't make it at all. That's what Jesus says. Make a vow and be determined to keep it or don't make it at all. Uh, notice that this idea of making a vow or an oath or a promise with an escape clause, well, that's from the evil one. That's from the evil one. And so as followers of Jesus who are seeking to maximise righteousness and maximise faithfulness, we won't play that game. If I make a promise, I will keep it no matter what. If I know I can't make a promise and keep, if I know I can't keep a promise, well, I won't make it. Uh, so often I've, I've come across tradies who make promises and then don't keep them. And I've you know, I've got friends who are tradies, and when I ask them, why, why do you make those promises? And they say, well, the customer really is kind of badgering us, and to make them happy, we make the promise. You see, 
That might buy them some time, but the customer will actually be angrier when the promise is broken than if they don't make the promise to start with. So brothers and sisters, when you make promises, do so with an absolute determination to keep them. When you claim truthfulness, do so because it is true. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Brothers and sisters, as followers of Jesus, as people who have been forgiven of our sins, we are called to live a life which maximises faithfulness. Faithfulness in our marriages and faithfulness in our promises. Do you find yourself trying to minimise things? Do you find yourself trying to, you know, find loopholes to minimise your obedience, to minimise your faithfulness? Then Jesus here is saying, repent. Turn away from such behaviour, for ultimately it is from the evil one. Now, friends, we know that such behaviour is ultimately from the evil one, and it's certainly not from God. Because, and this brings us to our final point, Jesus' teaching is a call for us to reflect the faithful character of God. It's a call for us to reflect the faithful character of God. You read through the scriptures, you see that God makes promises. And when God makes promises, his yes is yes, his no is no. When he makes promises, he is determined to keep them. And indeed, friends, in the person of Jesus, we see just how faithful God is to keeping his promises, no matter the cost. Uh, indeed, Matthew's gospel is a testimony to the faithfulness of God to his promises. And Matthew's gospel starts like this in verse 1 of chapter 1. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, if you know your Old Testaments, uh, you will know that David and Abraham are two very, very significant figures because they are people that God made very significant promises to. Abraham, uh, in Genesis 12, received a promise from God that through him and his descendants, that blessing would come to peoples of all the nations. And the blessing that is promised there is the blessing that was lost when Adam and Eve sinned and were cast out of the Garden of Eden. No longer God's people, uh, no longer in his place because they no longer lived under his rule. And as a result, they forfeited the blessing that comes with being God's people in God's place under God's rule. And God says to Abraham, through you and your descendants, I will somehow restore this blessing. Uh, David, who was a king over Israel and a descendant of Abraham, he receives a great promise from God in 2 Samuel 7. God promises King David that one of his descendants will be a king who will rule forever. And indeed, this uh, forever king who would be known as the Christ or the Messiah would be the figure, the descendant of Abraham, who would bring this blessing to the peoples of all the nations. And that is what Matthew is telling us at the start. Jesus is the descendant of David. He is the descendant of Abraham who would bring the blessing of forgiveness of sins, the blessing of dwelling with God for all of eternity to humanity. And friends, God made it all possible and kept that promise by allowing his son to die in our place, to take the punishment that we deserve for the sins we have committed, including adultery, including not keeping our promises. God, in his faithfulness, sent his son to die for us, to enable us to be forgiven so we could be blessed for all of eternity. And as we put our faith in Jesus, as we turn away from our sins, we can be forgiven and we can know that God will keep his promise of delivering us to be with him for all of eternity in new bodies, free from sin, free from death, free from sickness. And as those who have been forgiven, we are not to see our forgiveness as a way of minimising obedience, saying, I can just do whatever I want because God will forgive me. No, that's not how it works at all. When God forgives sinners, he expects sinners to commit themselves to maximising their obedience to him to maximising their commitment to living a righteous life. 
which today we hear also involves maximising faithfulness. Faithfulness in our marriages and faithfulness in the oaths and the promises that we make. Brothers and sisters, let us never think about how we can minimise our obedience, our righteousness or our faithfulness, for such things are from the evil one. But let us follow the example of our God and maximise our faithfulness. May God, by the power of his spirit, enable us to do what his word tells us to do. Amen.